I'm going to go ahead and do it. So <laughs> a couple of course announcements. Uh, today we are, um, we have a barbecue at seven o'clock. Um, so that should be fun. And um, Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Te Hayashi Lectureship in Cell Physiology at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Our speaker today is Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, who, who will be joined by Nicole King, the course director of the physiology course here at the MBL. While we remain restricted to having a limited in-person audience, we are excited for this opportunity to bring pieces of the MBL advanced research training courses to the public through the virtual endowed lecture series. The series is comprised of eight lectures throughout the summer from eight different courses, and we encourage you to register for as many as you're able. Over the years, generous friends and family have honored eminent scientists and loved ones with 26 endowed lectures at the MBL and this series would not be possible without the support. If you're interested in learning more about this opportunity, please email development at mbl.edu. This is a Zoom webinar and is being recorded. All guests have been muted. Students in the audience in the CLAP auditorium at the MBL will be asking questions throughout. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A function and we will manage them as time allows. Without further ado, please welcome Nicole King, investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and professor of genetics, genomics and development at the University of California, Berkeley. All right, good morning students. Good morning, uh, local visitors and a special welcome to our remote visitors, many of whom are uh, friends and alumni of this course. It's such a pleasure to bring you all together. This is such a treat. Um, today is a special lecture. It's in honor of Te Hayashi, who was a beloved member of the NBL family. His research focused on the molecular basis of uh, cell contraction and was really integral to a lot of the important early discoveries of the cytoskeleton that really spawned out of the MBL. His first exposure to the MBL was actually in 1939 as a student. And then later he strengthened this association with the MBL, first as an independent investigator, then as an MBL corporation member and a trustee. And he was a trustee emeritus at the time of his death. He was well loved, not just for his accomplishments in science, which were uh, important, but also for his indomitable spirit and his really contagious sense of humor. He was uh, famous in the community for hosting wild poker parties and, uh, and playing both tennis and table tennis. And I think uh, you know, my, my understanding was that he really sort of uh, emulated this, this idea that we have of the MBL as a place where you come and, and you science hard, but you also enjoy life. Um, this lecture was established in his honor in 2002 uh, by his uh, uh, many friends and supporters and by the MBL. And so it's fitting that our speaker today is Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, also known as the indomitable JLS. Um, she has become a, a truly value, valued and central member of the MBL community. Um, she is uh, a world leader, truly, in the study of cell biology. And what she brings to it is a, an integrative and really, I think, unique view of the dynamism of organelles within the cell, but also thinking about the cell as a whole. Um, and to that end, she has also become a pioneer in the development of uh, entirely new microscopy modalities. Together with Eric Betzik and Harold Haas at Chimelia, JLS has been a key player in the development of super resolution microscopy. 
And, and perhaps more importantly, she was a co-director of the physiology course uh, where she really um, uh, was key to helping develop you know, uh, this new view of cell biology that students are now taking out into their own labs and into the community. To me, and I think to many of us, JLS is a true inspiration of how to live a full life as a scientist. And, uh, and it's just such a pleasure to have her here. So please join me in welcoming JLS and I look forward to seeing her talk. Thank you. So I'll hand it over to you now. Okay, uh, everybody hear me now, I hope. Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I wanna thank Nicole for that really great uh, introduction. And um, I just wanna tell you how excited I am being, uh, I am uh, being here today. <laughs> Although it's remote, just the whole concept of being able to interact with the MBL community is, um, extremely exciting and, um, you know, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, I'm especially excited because this is a weekend that was always really dear to my heart when I was the MBL director and that's the 4th of July weekend. Um, so I wish all of the students, uh, good luck in the parade tomorrow. I don't know whether there's still the sort of enthusiastic balloon fights that are going to happen. But um, if they do, Wallace can be a good leader for you. Um, anyway, uh, MBL is a magical place and um, I'm excited to see that even with uh, what we've experienced the last year with all the shutdowns, it's still moving forward. Okay, so today um, I wanna talk about subcellular organelles that comprise all eukaryotic cells and uh, what we're discovering um, about them using some new imaging technologies. In presenting this work, um, I hope to be able to stimulate your thinking about how these technologies may help answer your own biological questions within cells and tissues. So when you see the work that I'm presenting, um, don't just be thinking from the framework that I'm presenting it, but from the framework of pretty much any question that you might wanna address within um, your particular system. So I wanna start by just sort of giving a bigger perspective of where eukaryotic cells fit in the kingdom of life. Uh, eukaryotic cells came into existence about 2 billion years ago uh, through an endosymbiont event um, occurring between an archaea and a bacterial cell. And we know from a genetic analyses that um, uh, basic uh, of, you know, if we analyze existing eukaryotic cells, um, which as you all know, are comprising all complex multicellular form, life forms on earth, uh, whether they be animals, plants, fungi, seaweeds, or amoeba. Um, what we know is that these eukaryotes seem to be all uh, derived from a branching tree that originates from a single eukaryotic origin, um, which we call the last eukaryotic co common ancestor. And this is a really important um, uh, realization, if you will, because it suggests that all existing eukaryotic cell share core principles in terms of the way they're organized and the way they're function, because ultimately they came from a common ancestor. And one of these core principles um, that uh, I think we will all agree on is the existence of internal membrane compartments uh, that characterize all eukaryotic cells. And these are just uh, some EM images of some of these compartments. Um, 
whether you're looking at a mouse fibroblast or if you're looking at a Toxoplasma gondii, which is a parasite um, that's very, very different in terms of its functions uh, and activities uh, within you know, our earth, if you will, uh, both these eukaryotic cells share the same set of nine membrane bound compartments, uh, which include the nucleus, the ER, the gold sheet, lysosomes, endosomes, et cetera. And you can see from these EM images that these organelles distribute throughout um, the entire cell. Now, each of these membrane bound compartments carry out crucial cellular roles, which again are conserved throughout eukaryotes. This includes the ER and Golgi involved in secretion, um, the ability to take up and degrade materials, which is carried out by endosomes and lysosomes, the ability to produce energy, which comes from mitochondria, uh, the ability to store and replicate DNA, which is housed, which occurs within the nucleus, the ability to detoxify a variety of different materials, which is uh, performed in the peroxisome, and the ability to store and distribute fat, which is carried out by the lip by lipid droplets. Now, it's only recently um, that we've been able to simultaneously view all of these organelles at the same time within the cell. We know, we know from biochemical and other types of um, work uh, the basic functions of these organelles, but it's only, as I mentioned recently, that we've really begun to interrogate what these organelles are doing within the cell and how they are behaving relative to each other. And so this is a, um, a spectral unmixing a lattice light sheet movie that you're looking at here, where we've introduced six different organelle markers uh, to label six of the nine organelles that I mentioned uh, in the prior slides. And what's exciting about this is that we can see how all, all these organelles are arranged and behaving uh, in one particular cell. Now, from this type of data set, um, it's possible to then come in and analyze the characteristics of these organelles. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, by segmenting out each of these different organelles, you can, count, you can quantify the total number of organelles, um, particular organelle types within the cell. Uh, you, can, or, you can determine how fast they're moving. Uh, you can determine the relative relationships to each other. And I'll just throw out some examples, for instance, we know the ER, uh, which is the largest of all of these organelles, occupies about 37 times the volume of the Golgi and nine times the volume of the mitochondria. We know that the numbers of lipid droplets, peroxisomes, and mitochondria each range from about 150 to 200 per cell. And from this data set, we know that lysosomes are the fastest moving objects within this cell. They move at about twice the speed of lipid droplets and peroxisomes. Visualizing many organelles simultaneously from these data sets also allowed us to examine whether these organelles come in close contact with each other to allow exchange of small lipids as well as metabolites between these organelles without fusion of the organelles. And from this type of uh, segmentation, you can see the significant co-associations uh, in this upper panel uh, between each of these different organelles where you can see two, three, and even four-way contacts, uh, close contacts between these organelles. We can also see um, uh, the frequency of these contacts by essentially creating a matrix representation of the contact site associations. And that's, rep that's shown in the bottom panel where you can see uh, the ER is, um, has the highest numbers of contacts and in addition is interacting with all other organelles. Now, here's an image of the ER in a cos 7 cell that I think nicely illustrates the ER's large size and expansive character. And I think helps explain how it can contact all other organelles in the cell because it's, it's spreading throughout the entire cell. Today, what I want to be focusing on is this organelle, the ER, describing its functional domains 
using new imaging techniques. Now, the ER carries out and integrates many crucial processes, from protein synthesis, folding, and transport, to calcium storage and release, to nuclear envelope formation. The ER's elaborate overall architecture consists of discrete morphological elements or substructures, as you can see here, but I'll just try to highlight them. These include tubules, three-way junctions, which are just um, the way that these tubules intersect with each other is by three-way junctions. <clears throat> Matrices, which are highly clustered three-way junctions, junctional elements of the ER. And sheets, which are regions where tubules have come so close to each other that they've smoothed out into a sheet-like appearance. These characteristic features of this meshwork or network of the ER extend from the nuclear envelope, which is a part of the ER, all the way out to the cell periphery. <clears throat> now the ER also has several functional domains. And three of these domains that I'm gonna be talking about today include sites of protein translation, sites of ER mitochondrial contact, and sites of ER export. Although we know the specific functions of these domains, we still don't understand their overall morphology and dynamics. And so to address this shortcoming, uh, my lab's been using new technologies to study the structure and function of these domains. And here are some of the technologies that we've been using. They include the lattice light sheet microscope, which I mentioned before that we used for looking um, in these uh, unmixing, uh, multispectral unmixing studies. Uh, the focused ion beam scanning electron micro uh, microscope. And I just want to emphasize the way that that, that system works is basically um, the system is able to section through entire tissues through a cycle of focused ion beam milling with scanning electron, um, electron micro microscopy visualization. So basically by a cycle of milling and imaging, uh, you can make your way through an entire tissue or cell um, <clears throat> at very high resolution to visualize the entire architecture of that structure. This is a very exciting new approach uh, for visualizing um, whole volumetric um, uh, cells or, or tissues. Combining you, with the focused ion beam uh, uh, electron uh, micrograph my, uh, micros my microscope, you can also combine it with uh, structural illumination microscopy. Um, and for that, because samples are cryo frozen for the FIB-SIM, um, you have to do cryo structural illumination microscopy or cryo confocal imaging of, of some, some sort. Um, and when you do that, you can superimpose um, the cryo obtained fluorescent image onto the EM image to get alignment. So that's another very exciting sort of application for um, expanding our understanding of organelles like the ER. And finally, uh, grazing incident structural illumination microscopy, uh, which is another approach for, for very fast imaging of our samples. So collectively, all of these microscope systems are allowing the interrogation um, of the ER as well as other organelles at dramatically improved spatial temporal uh, uh, scales. So I wanna now share with you some new insights we've obtained using these new uh, imaging systems in addressing the structure function of the three specialized ER functional domains that I just mentioned. Some of the results are unexpected and hopefully are gonna stimulate your thinking in this area because uh, they're certainly stimulating our thinking. So I wanna begin with protein translation sites. So this is a GI sim image of a COS7 cell. And uh, when you look at this, you, get, you immediately start thinking, okay, the ER is really complicated. And a key question in the field of ER biology is where on the ER surface are proteins being translated? We know that roughly 30% of the genome codes for secretome-related proteins. 
which are all translated from mRNAs attached to the ER surface. The regions of ER with bound ribosomes called rough ER have classically been defined as the sites of protein translation on the ER. But whether all ribosomes in the ER are in the process of translating proteins or only a subset is not known. It is also unclear which of the different ER morphological substructures I mentioned earlier supports translation. Is it ER tubules, three-way junctions, sheets, or matrices? ER matrices, which are shown here, are comprised, as I mentioned, of very tightly arranged three-way tubule junctions. Because of their fine, highly dynamic architecture, they've only recently been recognized as distinct from ER sheets as a consequence of being able to use techniques like this GI SIM, which, which employ ultra-fast, high-resolution imaging. What this allows is the ability to image features at four to 10 times faster than what's possible on conventional confocal microscopes. And because we're using structural illumination in combination with that, we can get a twofold increase in spatial resolution. So using GI SIM together with other approaches for imaging mRNA and protein synthesis, we've begun trying to clarify three questions. One is where is mRNA translation occurring on the ER? How are translation hosting ER substructures created and maintained? And do these ER substructures participate in regulating translation? Yeah, so in order to... Yeah. Yes. Just a quick question. Um, sure. I'm having, uh, I'd like to get a sense of how quickly the ER actually is remolding. So when we look at these movies, is that real time or are those sped up like in the prior slide? Those are sped up. But I should say that um, we can, so if we go back here, um, we know that it's, this is sped up. I mean, maybe about, I'd say, uh, one or two times, uh, three times perhaps. Um, we know that the ER can, um, if we do time-lapse imaging and map out the distribution from our lattice light sheet movies, where the ER is positioned throughout the cytoplasm, we know that these tubules can actually um, distribute throughout the entire, I mean, they, they essentially, the whole cytoplasm, um, has ER associated with it over the course of 15 minutes. Basically, the, the tubules are, are so dynamic that they allow the ER to basically have exposure of the entire cytoplasm um, over the time course of minutes. We also know that individual proteins can diffuse through this system over the course of about five to 10 minutes. If it's, a, if it's a transmembrane protein. It's much faster if it's a cytoplasmic protein, I mean, a, a luminal protein. So this is highly dynamic. This is sped up um, significantly in order to be able to see these structures. As I mentioned um, previously with conventional confocal imaging, you would not see these matrices. They would have been um, essentially smeared out. Okay, so we're gonna try to, look at where translation is occurring um, on the surface of this ER. Um, and to do that, we used a really exciting system developed by Rob Singer called the MS2 system to visualize mRNAs. Um, in particular, we're going to be using the system to visualize transmembrane proteins, um, which have signal sequences that direct them to the ER surface. So to be able to observe where translation is occurring and how mRNAs move along the ER during this process, we further introduced a marker for the ER itself because we've got to see where the ER is if we're going to see where these mRNAs are translating. So here's what we, what we found. Um, the membrane encoding mRNAs, uh, which are shown in either green, as green dots or pink dots, are clearly associated with the ER, which is shown in yellow. The, the, the dots that are labeled green are examples of the mRNA that have confined motion, while the pink mRNA are ones that are moving very quickly. 
along the surface of the ER. And so um, we see two different types of motion of these mRNAs associated with uh, the ER. And so the question is, well, is there, a, is there a significance to this? And to test, maybe it's connected to the translating capacity of these mRNAs, we treated cells with pyromycin, which causes premature chain termination during translation. And what you can see is that this shifted all of the mRNAs to the highly mobile forms. It increased their motion dramatically. And many of the mRNAs um, dissociated from the ER itself. So you can see this in the movie, but you can also see it in the quantification to the right, uh, where um, basically uh, when you dissociate, uh, when you cause premature chain termination with, the, with pure mycin, uh, dissociating the mRNA from uh, translocon, you get all of these mRNAs speeding up their motion. So this suggests that um, it, this would be consistent with the mRNAs um, that are anchored and showing uh, immobile or confined motion being mRNAs that are actually in the process of translation. So to further demonstrate the idea that slow mRNAs that we are visualizing on the ER represent populations of mRNA that are undergoing translation, we set up a different system to visualize both mRNA using the MS2 system and translation using the SunTag system developed by Ron Vale. Um, and this is what you're seeing in the diagram is uh, this dual system uh, where we're looking at the ER membrane protein cytochrome P450. So we have an MS2 tag for the cytochrome P450 mRNA, and we also are labeling uh, using the SunTag system newly synthesized cytochrome P450. And so if we look at where the mRNA for cytochrome P450 is and the protein that's being translated, we can see overlapped structures uh, where um, you can see the mRNA and purple is right next to where the SunTag uh, ER protein is being synthesized. So that's cool. But what's even cooler is that if you look at the mRNA trajectories, which are shown in yellow, uh, you can see that the mRNAs that are in the process of translating uh, the, the protein, the cytochrome P450 protein, they, are, they have highly confined trajectories. Consistent with the idea that um, basically you can use a motion of the mRNA on the ER surface as a readout for translation. So what we're going to be doing is using the, signi the, the signature of confined mRNA motion as a readout for protein translation on the ER. With this readout, we're gonna then ask whether protein translation is occurring at specific ER sites and how these sites are being formed and controlled. So let's return to the MS2 system for, uh, for mRNA tracking. Now, one of the things that we found, which was pretty amazing is that the translating mRNAs read out by their confined motion seem to be preferentially localized at the ER substructures that we call three-way uh, three junctions um, or matrices. And this is shown here for the mRNA that codes for the type one transmembrane protein GT4, GT46. But we also found this to be the case for all other examples of mRNAs coding for transmembrane and secreted proteins. This included type one, type two, multi-spanning and luminal proteins, which all co-translationally insert into the ER. So the green arrows point to the translating mRNAs, which you can see are all enriched at three-way junctions or matrices. Now further support for this conclusion came by examining uh, the, by examining the distribution of ribosomes on ER using focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy. As I mentioned, you can section through an entire cell using FibSim. This is just a small subsection of a cell where we've segmented out 
the endoplasmic reticulum in blue, and you can, and as well as the ribosomes in green. And what you can see is an enrichment of ribosomes, um, these green punctae on ER matrices, as well as fenestrated sheets, which are sort of flattened areas of the ER. Now, all the areas where we're seeing these, this enrichment of uh, ribosomes, um, and many of these ribosomes, I want to point out, if you look at them, are actually aligned as a polysome array, which means they're actively translating. Uh, when you see a, a series of ribosomes lined up, um, what we believe is that they're lined up because they're all anchored onto an mRNA, which itself is anchored onto the surface of the ER. And so these are mRNAs that are actively translating. Uh, and we see those polysomes at these three-way junctions and uh, matrices. Now, all of these, the ER matrices and junctions have a common feature in that they have increased ER surface area relative to isolated tubules. And so we think that the increased surface area and reduced net curvature uh, relative to isolated tubules might facilitate translation by stabilizing ribosomes bound to mRNA on these flatter structures. So an exciting question then is what can, what can help form and stabilize the, these ER structural elements? If these seem to be the sites where translation is occurring, is there anything in the cell that's driving the formation of these matrices? So Andy Moore in the lab, um, who is an incredible imager, um, decided to sort of look at this uh, by imaging the ER overnight using an AeriScan Ari microscopy, which gives about a twofold increase um, XY resolution over conventional confocal imaging. And what he found was that ER tubules were continuously being drawn together into matrices that migrated inward toward the nucleus. ER shaping proteins like reticulon and elastin and microtubules did not seem to be involved in this process. Instead, an understudied part of the cytoskeleton, the metan intermediate filaments seem to be involved. This is shown here in this dual color GI SIM image of the metan and SEC61 labeled ER that Andy, uh, Andy Moore uh, uh, has been studying. The metan filaments formed not like structures that co-localized with ER matrices as highlighted by the yellow arrows that you can see. In time-lapse movies, the metan knots could be seen anchored onto a region of highly confined ER tubules. The ER tubules then get pulled into dense, even denser arrays as the vimentin filaments contract. So these results suggested that vimentin knots aid in the formation of ER matrices. Um, so this was really surprising and led us to then ask what molecular machinery might link vimentin to the ER to allow this association. So our preliminary results suggest that the metan filaments associate with ER matrices through the anchoring proteins, plectin and nesprin-3, which normally serve to anchor the metan to the nuclear envelope. This is shown in the triple labeling experiment to the right. So nobody ever thought that nesprin-3 and plectin could be doing something similar in the ER as in the nuclear envelope. So we've got a lot to do in following up these observations, um, but we're super excited um, in terms of this co-association because we think that it could be very important in terms of enabling or driving the formation of these ER matrices. So given that we know that these ER matrices are being driven by the metan and being formed within the cell, um, the next question is whether they could be doing something that might be relevant for um, just bringing ER together. I have a question. And, uh, sure. Maybe before you get on to the next uh, part. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about these three-way junctions um, and how dynamic they might be, whether um, kind of uh, translation might stabilize those junctions. Absolutely. Finally, when, when we're part of that 
um, is whether there's anything special about the translocon in those regions, um, or is the translocon just kind of distributed uh, um, uniformly throughout the ER? These are really great questions. So um, we don't really have a handle on where the translocon is because the SEC61 beta that we're looking at um, distributes both in the translocon, but also is freely diffusing within the ER. Um, so we don't have a good readout for the translocon, which is made of many, many proteins. Our thinking is that active translocons are going to be um, preferentially localized at these three-way junctions. And that, yes, as you suggested, that the um, mRNA uh, could be helping to stabilize the ribosomes and the translocons at those sites. Um, absolutely. So that raises the question of, is there anything else happening at these sites that could facilitate translation occurring at these sites? And that's what this next movie- Jennifer, sorry, yes. one more slide. This one is from the audience, that, from our remote audience. Um, so the question is, are mRNAs bound to ER by being recruited to ER bound ribosomes, or is it the other way around? So who goes to the ER first? Ribosomes or mRNAs? Uh, ribosomes. I mean, the, we think that the ribosomes are, I mean, our data does not address that particular question um, because we have not been imaging independently ribosomes and mRNA. Um, but we certainly, I mean, the ribosome is made up of you know, a, a large and a small subunit. Um, when they come together, they can support mRNA translation. Um, exactly the sequence of that process, we do not have um, an understanding of. But what we do have an understanding of is we can track these mRNAs. We can watch the behavior of mRNAs and we can distinguish when the mRNA is translating. It's, it's, we, can, we can show where it's, where it's translating and its behavior when it's translating. So its behavior when it's translating is that it's confined in terms of its movement on the surface of the ER. And I wanna emphasize that we're only seeing this for proteins that are co-translationally being translated on the surface of the ER. We don't see this for other proteins like actin cytoplasmic proteins, for, for example, uh, which presumably have a very different behavior in terms of where they're being translated uh, in the cell. So we're just looking at secretome related mRNAs uh, proteins um, and their mRNAs. Okay, now you guys are gonna get excited by this next part, because I certainly was very excited. So let's look at these matrices. Um, and let's look at these matrices in the context of other organelles. And one of the things that jumps right out when you do fast GI sim imaging, as shown in this movie here, uh, done in collaboration with Dong, uh, Dong uh, Lee, uh, uh, Liu, at, uh, who's now, who was at Chenelia, but now has his own lab, uh, in China, is that the ER three-way junctions and matrices often entrap organelles like the lysosome, which you can see here. So lysosomes are labeled in green, uh, and you can see they move very quickly along microtubules. Uh, they, are, they motor along a microtubule, but they also adhere to the ER. You can see that they're very closely associated with the ER. And when they run into a three-way junction on the surface of the ER, uh, they can get entrapped. Uh, and very quickly, the ER can sort of wrap around that and you get a type of a matrix that's formed. So um, this led us to ask whether the association of lysosomes with these ER elements facilitated or hindered the mRNA translation we knew was also occurring at these sites. So to test this, we returned to our mRNA imaging system. Specifically, we labeled mRNA coding for cytochrome P450 and lysosomes 
and then, and then looked at where the sun tag signal from cytochrome P450 appeared. As you can see, cytochrome P450 translation was occurring at sites next to lysosomes, as evidenced by the close association between the sun tag signal for cytochrome P450, lysosomes, and mRNA. So given these results, we wondered whether lysosomes near mRNA on the ER might facilitate translation of the mRNA. So such, such facilitation could occur by several different mechanisms. For example, proteolytic activity on the, on the lysosome could release a local pool of amino acids for driving protein translation on the ER. Alternatively, the presence of mTOR on the lysosome surface could locally activate translation machinery. So we tested these possibilities by interfering with these different lysosomal activities and then looking at their effects on translation of a transmembrane encoding mRNA. And what we found, and I want to emphasize um, the postdoc, uh, Heejin Choi, uh, has uh, been the person who's been driving this. What Heejin found was that only when lysosomal degradative activity was impaired, either by addition of a protease cocktail mix or chloroquine treatment, was there a decrease in translation activity with mRNA molecules now decreasing their immobile fraction. So these results that lysosomes near ER translation sites increase translation efficiency, um, I think offer a lot of very exciting sort of um, ways to think about how translation might be being regulated on the surface of the ER. Um, for instance, it could be um, significant uh, because local release of amino acids might by amino acid transporters or ion channels might, might really play a cr critical role in allowing charging of the mRNAs that ultimately are gonna be translating. Now our finding that mTOR inhibition has no effect on translation of membrane encoding mRNAs is consistent with prior biochemical data showing that the secretome mRNAs do not have mTOR controllable five, five prime top elements. So we don't think mTOR association with the lysosome is what's important about this co-association. Rather, we think it's release of amino acids, uh, local sort of uh, enrichment of amino acids that the lysosome would pro provide for translation at these sites. Now, it's clear Excuse we've me. got a lot. Yes. How do you know the cell's not just unhappy because you've inhibited the protease? What leads you to argue so strongly that it's a direct effect of a lysosome that's near yes. ribosomes so, rather than some just general deleterious effect on the cell? So we can we see a similar, I mean, not as potent um, effect with chloroquine, which would also block amino acid release um, by inhibiting the uh, there are amino acids in the medium of these cells as well. So I guess exactly. I'm asking, how do you know this isn't just a general cellular stress response to an impairment of lysosomal function? So that's a super good question. And one way that we've been addressing it is we starve cells. We can amino acid deplete cells and then look at what's going on. And we see very close association of the lysosomes with these sites of translation. In fact, um, we get um, very bright sun tag signals specifically at these sites where lysosomes are localized. So that would support, further support the idea that under conditions where we're depleting sort of free amino acids um, through starvation, amino acid starvation, that um, the lysosome uh, close you know, association with these three-way junctions could be important. But I agree, we still, this is very, this is unpublished data. There's tons that we have to do to follow up on this. Um, but I think that they illustrate, and this is really what I wanna sort of emphasize for the talk, is that our ability to be able to observe the mRNA and ER structural dynamics together with improved imaging strategies um, 
makes it possible to begin thinking about new biology that might be impacting the system. So in this case, we found that specific ER structures, including matrices and junctions, seem to support protein translation. And we also learned that these ER structures are stabilized by the metan intermediate filaments um, and that they trap lysosomes. Um, and we also know that lysosomes uh, have the ability to release amino acids uh, locally. So uh, the thinking is that this might play a role in improving translation efficiency. Now, one thing that I think is really interesting in the literature, if you look at the metan and the cells that it is highly expressed in, um, once one, it's the top hit of plasma cells, which are cells that are massively expressing um, IgG in order to release antibodies from cells. Uh, and that means a huge upregulation of the secretome. Um, and so it's quite interesting that the metin is the top hit for being expressed in those cell types, because in our way of thinking, the vimentin is driving a new form of ER organization, which we think drives more trapping of organelles like lysosomes, which could themselves be facilitating um, translation through their ability to localize, to, to locally release metabolites. That is still something that we, we need, you know, the field needs to further investigate, but we think it's a, it's a really interesting uh, possibility for how the dynamism of all these organelles uh, could be very much regulated. I, I have a quick question also. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, do you have any thoughts as to why when you get the lysosome coming in and kind of getting trapped by the ER, it doesn't really appear that you see any kind of like membrane fusion or anything at those sites? So how is the lysosome just kind of being there associated causing these changes without any kind of like membrane fusion or like local release. That's yeah. Very okay. That's great. And that actually leads to the next section, which is contact sites. Um, in the case of the EOR lysosome association, there's no fusion there because the, 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 um, uh, the proteins that drive the fusion um, of organelles, you don't have the proper, um, uh, fusion proteins that on the surface of the ER and lysosomes to allow those two membranes to fuse. Um, instead, what you have are dynamic tethering molecules that stabilize the association. Um, and that's, you know, we still don't understand um, all of the different tethering molecules that are involved in that. Uh, but uh, one of them I'm going to be talking about, which is VAP B, which uh, plays a key role in tethering ER to many different organelles. And it, but what I'm gonna be focusing in on is um, looking at the role of these tethering proteins in creating contact sites of the ER with mitochondria. But you could also be thinking from the framework of how these molecules might be doing it for ER lysosome contacts. So these contact sites, um, which is what I'm gonna be focused on now, um, provide an interface for direct channeling of metabolites, lipids, and ions between the ER, and in this case, what I'm going to be focused on, mitochondria. And so they are playing very important roles for many aspects of mitochondrial biology, which need input of materials from ER, like lipids and calcium. So existing tools of Im and imaging approaches fall short in studying many questions related to the structure and dynamics of these contact sites in their native environment. Um, so light microscopy has insufficient resolution. Biosensors, because these contact sites are super small, biosensors drive the formation of aberrant contact sites and biochemical strategies that have been used uh, through fractionation approaches change membrane shape and its environment. Even transmission EM has the problem of chemical fixation, altering contact site structure, and we don't understand how tethering molecules move into contact sites. So what I wanna now focus on, on are three questions related to these contact sites and whether we can use different new imaging strategies to begin to address these questions, which include 
how dynamic are ER mitochondrial contacts? How, do ER, how does the ER shape change at these contact sites? And how do tethering molecules move into and out of these contact sites? So the three imaging approaches that I wanna share with you that we've been using for addressing this include the lattice light sheet, um, which can allow us to assess contact site abundance and dynamics, FibSim uh, in high pressure frozen cells to examine the native architecture of contact sites and single particle tracking palm to interrogate the motion and behavior of single contact sites, uh, single molecules at contact sites. So here's a lattice light sheet multispectral movie showing all ER mitochondrial contact sites in a live cell. To the left are the mitochondria alone, which we segmented out from 3D data sets. To the right, shown in green, are all regions of mitochondria where ER make contact based on pixel overlap. While this movie is diffraction limited, it nevertheless shows that ER mitochondrial contact sites are numerous and rearrange over the course of tens of minutes. So to get a better resolution of these contact sites, we move to FibSim. And here's a FibSim of an ER mitochondrial contact site with a contact site highlighted in red. Because of FibSim's isotropic resolution, it's possible to see the full 3D character of the contact site. Note that the ER has a flattened shape at the contact site informed by the curvature of mitochondria. This implies that molecular tethers at these sites generate adhesive-like forces that can bend and anchor ER onto the mitochondria. FibSim is static, so to begin characterizing how the tethering molecules at contact sites might be behaving, we turn to single particle tracking PALM, a super resolution technique developed for tracking single molecules in live cells. Now here are single molecule trajectories of the ER resonant protein cow reticulum mapped onto the structure of the ER obtained by fast pseudo turf imaging. To be able to observe these trajectories, cow reticulum was attached to a halo tag, which a bright photoactivatable dye can bind. This doesn't work with just conventional photoactivatable fluorescent proteins. They're not bright enough. By illuminating the, the photoactivatable dye, we could isolate and track individual molecules within the ER at super resolution. And as you can see from its trajectories, cow reticulum, uh, which is what we're tracking here, moves freely throughout the ER network with no areas uh, where it slows down or becomes immobilized. And this movie is real time um, to give you a flavor of the overall dynamics of the ER over that period, but also how fast these molecules are moving within the ER. So now we're gonna look at the tra trajectories of an ER mitochondrial contact pro site protein, and that is VAP-B. Um, so VAP-B forms a tethering complex with a mitochondrial protein PTPIP51 at ER mitochondrial contact sites. By single molecule tracking of VAP-B, we hoped to determine whether VAP-B undergoes stable interactions at contact sites or whether its interactions are more transient and dynamic. And so Chris Obera and Johnny Nixon Abel in the lab um, uh, did just that. Uh, and in order to do that, what they did is they tracked VAP-B's behavior um, using a halo tag VAP-B construct in cells that were also expressing ER and mitochondrial markers to give structural context. So what Chris and Johnny found was that VAP-B exhibited hovering motion at sites where ER and mitochondria overlapped. In other areas of the ER, however, VAP-B diffused freely, like cow reticulum. So let's examine a montage of multiple VAP-B trajectories, which you're looking at here, each separately colored. And when you do that, you can see that a single VAP-B molecule can rapidly diffuse, then suddenly start hovering over a particular spot only to move out of this spot and continue its random diffusion in the ER. And this is a single VAP-B trajectory just showing that. You can see um, the red areas are the trajectories where it's hovering over a particular area, which turns out to be mitochondria. And the blue, or the, uh, the blue is where it's just freely diffusing in the ER uh, membranes. Now this ability for us to be able to track these molecules was exciting 
uh, because we could start quantifying our data. So what we're gonna be looking at is um, single ER mitochondrial contact sites and looking at whether there are structurally regulated subdomains of VAPB behavior within these sites. We can do this because we can map the diffusion coefficient of VAPB anywhere in the cell, it, it anywhere when it's moving within either these sites in the ER or elsewhere. So supporting the idea that there are structurally regulated subdomains of VAPP at these contact sites, we found that the diffusion coefficients of individual VAPP molecules gradually declined as these molecules move closer to the center of the contact site. Um, in fact, we found that there was a single centralized low diffusion well appearing at all contact sites, which had a roughly similar size as well as shape. As shown in this graph, to, to, as shown in the graph to the right, um, you can see that VAPI molecules uh, begin changing their motion at distinct transition zones on either side of the low diffusion, diffusion well, with the molecules able to move out in and out of, uh, of that well. Now, interestingly, we found that concent the concentration and diffusional landscape of VAPI at contact sites changed when cells were starved which is a condition known to enhance ER mitochondrial contact activity. Specifically, the size of the contact site enlarged and VAPB molecules moved a tad slower within them. By enlarging in this manner, ER mitochondrial contact sites and starved cells could facilitate greater calcium and lipid import into the mitochondria, we believe, boosting its metabolic activities in the absence of glucose and other exogenously supplied nutrients. So we next looked for other conditions that might result in changes in VAPB's behavior at ER mitochondrial contact sites. Now, prior work has shown that a heterozygous P56S mutation in VAPB leads to ALS, a, a, a neurological uh, disorder. To test if this mutation causes structural changes at ER mitochondrial contact sites, we, we performed single molecule tracking in cells expressing the mutant. As shown in these diffusion maps, the overall size of the P56S containing contact site did not change relative to wild type VAPB at contact sites. However, individual P56S VAPB molecules entered multiple low diffusion wells at these contact sites, with their diffusion in these wells extremely slow. So one interpretation of these results is that P the P56S VAPB mutant makes VAPB's interactions with mitochondria tighter, creating Velcro-like adhesion in contrast to the less adhesive character of wild-type contact sites. This might prevent the P56S contact site from being able to remodel and repurpose itself under different physiological conditions, thereby leading to the disease. Now, proving this possibility is gonna obviously require a lot more work but we now have the tools to address this and other questions, such as how um, ion channels like IP3 receptor behave at these sites at, a sing at single molecule resolution. Now I wanna now, um, I know we're running, uh, we're in the last 10 minutes of this presentation. So I wanna move to the third of these specialized ER, ER subdomains that we've been studying, which are ER export sites. Um, this is where newly synthesized proteins in the ER enter the secretory pathway. And it's, it's a vital role played by the ER. Now, much is known in this area, but we still lack a full understanding of the overall architecture and dynamics of this process. So here's just an example of what we've known uh, from the past. This is a confocal movie following the trajectories of ER to Golgi transport intermediates carrying a GFP tag temperature sensitive viral glycoprotein, BSVG, after its release from the ER by temperature shift. Note that these transport intermediates um, are originating at a peripheral site and then they're moving along microtubules to reach the centralized gold sheet. Now, these movies are really exciting. They're really pretty to watch, but they are diffraction limited and therefore they can't tell us a lot of things about what these structures um, look like 
um, and are actually um, <clears throat> how they're really behaving. And so the, the, the questions that we're interested in trying to um, sort of push forward with some new technology include what is the alter structure of the ER exit site um, that underlies the function of the ER exit site? How's cargo sorted into the ER exit site? And how do ER exit sites give rise to transport intermediates? We've been tackling these questions, as I mentioned, with a variety of different imaging strategies that bring together structure, dynamics, and interactions. So starting with structure, we've been using whole cell volumetric EM imaging based on FibSim to gain insights into the overall ER exit site and transport intermediate morphology. Now, prior serial section TEM approaches were limited in their ability to fully study ER exit site and transport intermediate morphologies because of their thick Z slices, which were usually 40 to 100 nanometers, and their small volume sampling size. With FIPSIM, which has been pioneered at Harold Hassett, by Harold Hess at Genelia, it's possible to view the entire cell volume at isotropic resolution. And if milling is, fine, is done at a fine enough scale, sections as thin as four nanometer thickness can be viewed, allowing isotropic X, Y, and Z resolution through an entire cell. Moreover, if the cells being imaged express a fluorescent protein, it's also possible to correlate the fluorescent signal to the EM image. Now here's an example of a reconstructed volume of a whole HeLa cell at four nanometer isotropic resolution. It took about two weeks of continuous imaging and milling cycles to accomplish this, and that was only possible by technical innovations on this FibSim system by Harold, the Harold Hess team at Genelia. You can see the hundreds of sections acquired through the entire cell, which makes possible the nanos nanoscale analysis of any subcellular structure in the context of the whole cell. Now, ER exit sites are not easily identifiable by their structure alone. So FIPSIM had to be combined with correlative cryosim of ER exit site markers. One such, one such marker is COP, the COP2 subunit SEC23, which together with other COP2 subunits forms a coat scaffold that regulates cargo export from the ER. So we transfected cells with SEC23 fluorescent protein to visualize ER exit sites then high pressure froze the cell and then prepared them for cryocorrelative FIBSIM imaging. What you are seeing here is a SIM image of SEC23 positive ER exit sites colored in magenta registered onto the whole cell FIBSIM image. Note there are hundreds of ER exit sites scattered throughout the cytoplasm. Now scrolling through the serial images comprising one of these ER exit sites as shown here you can see the fluorescent label representing the overlapping COP2 signal. Now, manual segmentation of the membranes of one of these ER exit sites is shown here. And if we assemble all the segmented images together, you can see an, ER, an individual ER exit site consists of an intertwined tubule network connected to the ER through a slightly constricted neck shown in red. Microtubules often are seen in close association with these sites. After going through hundreds of these ER exit sites through the cell, um, accomplished by Aubrey Weigel and uh, Chiel and Chen in the lab, we found that the average diameter of the entire ER exit site was about 360 nanometers, and the tubule diameter uh, within the ER exit site about 40 to 60 nanometers. Now, earlier transmission EM studies likely missed this tubular morphology because their resolution was 10 times poor in the Z dimension relative to our FIPSIM approach, which is four nanometers. This would make a slice through an ER exit site easily interpreted as a cluster of vesicles, which is what people previously thought about these sites. So we next asked how this ER exit site receptacle is affected when a bolus of excess cargo enters it. So to address this, we examined ER exit sites by cryosim, fibsim, a short time after synchronized release of a bolus of cargo from the ER using a hook and release strategy called RUSH developed by Frank Perez at the Curie. In the strategy, 
cargo accumulates in the ER until it is released by removal of the hook through biotin addition. The cargo then moves as a bolus into ER exit sites and their transport intermediates. So we express the cargo protein TNF-alpha tagged with a rush hook in cells and then examine the cells by FibSim eight minutes after biotin-induced release of the construct from the ER. What we found as shown in the, the, the right-hand image was that ER exit sites become enlarged in response to the release of, bolus, of a bolus of cargo. And you can see this in the movies as you scroll through, through the ER exit site. Segmentation and 3D rendering of this structure shown in the bottom panel, um, or panels because we're comparing it to wild type, revealed it had an overall organization, but was enlarged relative to an air exit site observed in non-transfected cells shown to the left. So we further found that the TNF alpha rush cargo fluorescence was enriched in this intertwined ear exit site receptacle rather than in any surrounding vesicle. So quantifying this data shown here um, showed that the diameter of the entire ear exit site during this process increased over twofold. And this coincided with enlargement of tubules within the network and connecting neck. The diameters of nearby ER by contrast remained unchanged. So altogether, the results indicated that the size of the ER exit site and its associated tubules can undergo dynamic regulation to accommodate a large quantity of membrane proteins without fundamentally changing its core architecture or organization. So given this conclusion, we next examined how cargo gets released from the ear exit site and moves to the gold sheet. So by live cell imaging, we could observe rush cargos, including this TNF alpha shown here, departing from ear exit sites through elongated tubule transport intermediates, moving towards the gold sheet. To examine the ultra structure of these tubule transport intermediates and their relationship to the ear exit sites, we froze cells at eight minutes of biotin release and prepared them for whole cell cryosim fibsim. Here are some examples of the 3D renderings of the transport intermediates captured eight minutes after release of TNF alpha rush from the ER. They all shared a pearled membrane morphology. As the volume is scrolled through, you can see the tubule structures are all positive for TNF alpha rush fluorescence. If we zoom into one in the center, you can see it contains the TNF-alpha rush fluorescence, which fills the tubules, but is most visible in the pearled regions. This transport intermediate remained associated with an ER exit site at its right and was closely aligned with a microtubule. Here's this transport intermediate we're just looking at, showing its enrichment of TNF-alpha rush cargo and its pearled morphology. You can also see that the tubule is aligned along a microtubule and originates at an ER exit site. This morphology was not an artifact of rush cargo overexpression because we could also find these structures in non-transfected cells and they displayed the same characteristics, including close proximity to an ER exit site, a pearled membrane shape and close association with microtubules. So these results suggested that the pearl transport intermediates may be a common but not exclusive vessel for delivery of secretory proteins to the Golgi, uh, which is a new finding in the sense that we previously thought that it was just uh, sort of round little vesicles that were moving from ER to Golgi. So here are the important messages from these experiments. First, the substructure of the ER exit site has a shape we did not previously understand. The sim revealed that the ER exit sites are discrete structures with interconnected tubules. Second, while I don't have time to show the data, correlating the FibSim results with dynamic live cell imaging revealed that the regulatory code proteins, COP2 and COP1, were both present at ER exit sites, with COP1 moving with cargo out of the ER exit site and COP2 remaining with the structure. Third, we found that the transport intermediates that come out of these ER exit sites can appear as long tubules with periodic varicosities um, and that they eventually fuse with the Golgi. So together, the results show that the cryocorrelative FibSim approach is a powerful new a tool for exploring the ultrastructure 
not only of the secretory pathway, but potentially other pathways throughout cells. Um, it's very powerful because we can see the whole cell uh, and uh, you know, by segmenting out all of these different structures, uh, you can see their relationships with each other. So in conclusion, I've shared with you today different ways to interrogate the ER and its domains at different spatial temporal scales using new imaging modalities. So these, approach, these approaches, um, we believe, have much to offer for future research on the localization, organization, and activity of organelles and their constituents. And I hope I've stimulated some ideas for how you might begin investigating um, your own areas of interest using these different imaging modalities. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people in my lab, as well as our Janelia and outside collaborators for helping to make this work possible. Um, so the people highlighted in yellow in my lab are the ones who uh, performed all of the work that I talked to you about today. Um, I'll just shout out uh, Chris Obero and uh, Johnny Nixon Abel did the, the ER single particle tracking work uh, connecting with it uh, related to that the uh, mitochondrial ER contact sites. Andy Moore did the work uh, with the Menton. Alex Vaughn and Sarah Cohen developed the multispectral imaging lattice light sheet imaging approach. Chilung Chang and Aubrey Beigel did the work with uh, FIPSIM uh, reconstruction. And He Jin uh, Choi uh, did the work on M uh, mRNA tracking, tracking um, and its relationship to lysosomes. I want to really emphasize that all of this was only possible through close collaborations with uh, Janelia tool developers, including Harold Hess and Eric Betzik, um, Luke Levis for, for the dyes that we used. Uh, we also closely collaborated with Rob Singer with mRNA work. And I also want to um, thank our outside collaborators, in particular, Craig Blackstone, who uh, really got us super interested in the first place uh, for ER, <coughs> uh, understanding ER. So um, thank you. <coughs> and I'm looking forward to um, talking, uh, answering, uh, and discussing various aspects of this work. Jennifer, this is Nicole. You can't see me, but that's yeah. right there. <laughs> Um, okay, we have a, a bunch of really wonderful questions that have come in from remote uh, watchers and listeners. Uh, unfortunately, I think we only have time for one. Uh, and so this question is from Franz Hoxtenbach uh, at the University of Amsterdam. So um, thank you, Jennifer, for your wonderful and inspiring presentation. Will your advanced techniques allow you to settle the argument on vesicular transport model versus a cisternal maturation model? <laughs> In the gold sheet. Yep. That's a great question. Um, it would be fun to be able to <clears throat> um, resolve that controversy, but um, I think it's going to be t t it's going to be hard. Um, the gold sheet is a very the the individual cisterna that comprise the stack of the gold sheet are very very closely aligned and um, almost at the limit of the resolving capability of the FIBSIM uh, system. Uh, but, you know, there are, you know, other, there are features of the system that we might be able to tease out um, in the same way that you can infer, uh, you can infer a lot about the, the structure of the atom without actually seeing it um, uh, or subatomic, you know, particle organization. I think you can make predictions about the way that the gold sheet is behaving that supports one model or another. And then using these technologies, see which of these different predictions best are best supported. So basically that would be, I think, the strategy uh, for going about uh, trying to address that, that controversy. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a long standing controversy. Um, and uh, yeah, I can, uh, we, we've just published a paper in um, Nature showing FIBSIM reconstruction, so a lot of these FIBSIM reconstruction data sets. And I think that, that we have a gold sheet in that uh, image that you can take a look at. It is an extremely complicated structure. 
Um, it's not just a simple pancake like thing. It's many, many pancakes inter interlinked with tubules. Um, so just looking at that structure itself uh, makes you begin thinking that there's some lots of different things happening in that Golgi than we would have really uh, anticipated with our simple cartoon models. <clears throat> Sorry for that long response. No, 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 that was great. That was great. I, I just want to say that was a, a stunning talk and uh, it really just uh, felt like I was in the cell traveling around. It was so exciting. Uh, there should be a Disney ride based on the cell, inner workings of the cell. Um, so I think at this point we should um, end the webinar. Thank our remote visitors for being here. We really, uh, it was fun to be able to share a taste of the class with you. Um, and I, let's just have one more round of applause for you. Thank you so much. Again. Thank you. Thank you for attending. We hope you'll consider registering for other lectures in the virtual endowed lecture series. A recording uh, will be available on the website in the coming days. Also, our Friday evening lecture series has gone virtual once again. And we hope you'll consider registering for Cliff Brangwin's lecture this Friday, uh, July 